in your Bibles, book of Revelation, in the 14th chapter, <clears throat> moving through this book, uh, a book of special significance and importance because it is God's last word to his people. John wrote this about 95 A.D. We're told in the, as the book begins that this is a message that God the Father gave to His Son, Jesus Christ, to give to His churches. So it is addressed specifically to the churches of Jesus Christ. Seven specific churches in chapters 2 and 3 but by the intention of the Spirit of God, it has been preserved because it is a message for all of us in the churches down through history. When you think about it, the Apostle Paul, the Apostle Peter, have been dead for almost 30 years when John writes this letter. The other apostles have passed off the scene now John in his elderly years is in exile on Patmos and God has a final word to say to his people. It is a word about prophecy, about future events. I am always amazed to read when uh, certain believers say, well, prophecy is one of those things not of the same level of importance that would require us to, uh, you know, divide over. Uh, how can we say that when so much of the Bible is prophetic and then this last book is given as God's final word? And what it does is what no other book of the Bible does. There are other prophetic sections of the Bible, other prophetic books. But the book of Revelation lays out now with detail and order what has not been made known before. It doesn't change any prior prophecies, but it does make more clear than has done before how these things will unfold. And uh, we are looking at that as we come to chapter 14. There has been an order. Beginning with chapter 6, we have a series of judgments that happen sequentially. Seven seals, followed by seven trumpets. Each time a seal is broken, a judgment comes. Every time a trumpet sounds, a judgment comes. Then we have an interlude or a pause, which really will go from chapters 10 to, uh, through 15. Uh, the heart of it is verse, uh, chapters 11 through 14. Uh, we'll talk more about that when we get into chapter 15. Then we will pick up the bold judgments, which are the last. There is increasing severity as these judgments move along. The last seven judgments, the bowl judgments, every time a bowl is turned over, a judgment is poured out on the earth. We'll climax with the return of Christ to earth to establish his kingdom. His return will be in chapter 19. The kingdom will be established in chapter 20. So, uh, it's an orderly book. It's a book that clarifies and helps us to understand. It was a book intended to be studied and understood. Because remember, we are told its beginning and its end. There is blessing upon those who read this book and heed it. We couldn't pay attention to something we didn't understand. And you couldn't obey the truths and live in light of them if they were not clear. And as we move through it, we see that that doesn't mean we understand everything because certain things that are made known here won't be clear until they come to pass. But basically the book and its contents are things we understand. In chapter 14, 
if you're talking about some key events that will be taking place during the last half of the seven years, the last three and a half years that lead up to the return of Christ, now he's going to give a little bit of an overview in chapter 14 of events that will come. Chapters 12 and 13 in particular could be discouraging. Seems like the devil is winning. He's cast out of heaven in chapter 12, but he's wreaking terror on the earth. Can the world come to the point where it is joined together in the worship of one being, one person? The devil's man, the Antichrist. And anyone who won't worship him must die. And the infamous number 666 comes out of the end of chapter 13. But chapter 14 gives an overview of how things are going to end up. And that's an encouragement to believers. It will be an encouragement to God's people who are going through this time of tribulation. The first part of the chapter 14, the first five verses, have Christ standing on Mount Zion. He is victorious. He has returned to earth. The devil loses. The Antichrist is defeated. He is standing on Mount Zion. With him are 144,000 Jewish men, 12,000 from each of the tribes of Israel. God's promises to the nation Israel will be fulfilled, as the prophets of old have said. We saw in verses 6 and 7 an angel flying with the eternal gospel. That even during this terrible time, the message of redemption and salvation through faith in Christ alone will be proclaimed. This is consistent with what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 24 during his earthly ministry. This gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed through the whole earth. And then the end will come. And so we get a preview of that. Verse 8 announced the fall of Babylon. Very important event. Just mentioned here. It will fall. It will be defeated. Crushed. The details will be in chapter 17 and chapter 18. This godless world system will be destroyed. Then a reminder, the ultimate destiny of unbelievers is an eternal hell. And you have that very clear description of that in verses 9 to 11, where people bear the full brunt of the wrath of God with no mercy mixed in, in a torment that goes on into the ages of the ages, forever and ever. Then we had the last two verses we've looked at, encouragement to God's people. You know, God wants to encourage His people even in the worst of times. But He wants to encourage the churches to stay faithful in their period of time. He draws our attention to the end. It's the devil's trap to tell people prophecy is not that important. We just trust God with the future. We do trust God with the future. Because we trust in the God of the future. We believe that what he has said about the future is important for us to understand and know. And so in verse 12 he said, here is the perseverance of the saints. I want to put up just those points of review in verses 12 and 13. It's been a couple of weeks, and I realize some of us have short memories. Here is the perseverance of the saints. First point is, we saw in this, these are what we used at the conclusion of our study of these two verses. Saints persevere because of the reality of hell. I mean, he's just talked about the awfulness of hell. Then he said, here is the perseverance of the saints. What helps us endure? We realize Christ will win the first part of chapter 14. He will stand victorious on this earth. 
And in the letters to the churches in chapters 2 and 3, he promised that those faithful ones in the churches would rule and reign with him in that kingdom when he comes. He tells, has told of the awfulness of hell, the terribleness of an eternity in hell. Realizing where we're going puts the sufferings of this time in perspective and enables us to endure, to persevere. We are those, so number two, saints live in obedience to God's word. They keep his commandments. I'm not particularly talking about the Ten Commandments. But the commands that God has given us in his word for us as his people, as the church. Uh, we are characterized by obedience to the word of God. Thirdly, saints live with their faith in Christ. Salvation begins when we place our faith in Christ. From that point on, we live with, as a, in a life of faith in Christ. We keep our faith in Him. They keep the commandments of God and their faith in Christ. The encouragement of us in the difficult times. Lord, we trust You. I've not only trusted Christ as my Savior from sin and all its penalty, I live by faith in Him day by day, as does every believer. Trusting Him, knowing all things work together for good to those who love God, those who are called according to His purpose. Even the things we don't understand, don't have the answer to why would this happen. Our faith is unshakable in Jesus Christ. His work on our behalf, His love for us. Fourthly, saints are blessed in death. True here for this. Believers that will die in this awful time of tribulation as martyrs. But it's true for every believer. The blessing here is for the dead who die in the Lord from now on. We're reminded that for the believer, death is an enemy in that we don't look forward to it. And it is the remnant of the consequences of sin. But even that will over, be overcome, as we sang in Anastasis. And it's the resurrection. And someday we will be raised again. And when we're absent from the body, we'll be present with the Lord. So death is not a defeating enemy. So blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, that they may rest from their labors. And in this time people will die terrible deaths, painful deaths as martyrs. But for believers, death is a rest. In contrast to the unbeliever, verse 11, the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever. They have no rest night and day. They have no future to look forward to. No matter what life brings to the believer, death, no matter how it comes, relieves me from the toil and agonies can be associated with this life and brings me into the rest and peace that will be mine for eternity. And lastly, saints will be rewarded for their works after death. And that's brought their deeds follow with them. Uh, we will be judged at the Vima seat to be rewarded for what we have done in the flesh. But he's ready to wrap this preview up in verses 14 to 20. And we come to an event that is well known by name, even if the contents are confusing to many people. This brings us to Armageddon. What will happen to this unbelieving world and those in it when Jesus Christ comes back to stand on Mount Zion, as he talked about in the opening verses of this chapter? Again, all of this will be put in order as we move along. This is a preview of events, but they're not important in order here. 
Because the ultimate sentencing to hell that we talked about in verses 9 to 11 are found at the end of chapter 20. But the return at Armageddon is recorded in chapter 19 of Revelation. So things will be sorted out even further as we move along through Revelation. God will clarify now the order in which these things will take place and fill in the details. God's wrath is not a pleasant subject. We saw the ultimate display of God's wrath when people are, will be sentenced to hell in verses 9 to 11. When Christ returns to earth at the end of that seven year period called the tribulation, this will not be a pleasant time for the people of this world. It will be a deliverance for those who have come to trust Christ during that period and not been martyred. But by and large for the world, it is a time of destruction, doom, death. God speaks a lot about his love. He speaks a lot about his wrath. We, don't want, to, we want to be careful that we focus on one and not the other. He is a God of love. There is no way to minimize that. We sing of it. Uh, it is a wonder, the love of God. But the wrath of God is just as real and just as sure. So Armageddon, the time of Christ return to earth. Look at verse 14. Then I looked, and behold, and attention is drawn. Now look, this is what I saw. Pay attention. Behold, a white cloud, and sitting on the cloud was one like a son of man, having a golden crown on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. See, it's a white cloud. You know, sometimes on the uh, days when the sky is so blue and then you have these billowy white clouds and you look at it, they almost speak glory. Wow, how awesome. How splendid in the splendor. And for us as believers, you sometimes look and say, boy, I could see Christ coming through those clouds. Not yet. <coughs> But he is coming to earth again, and it will be in clouds. A white cloud, sitting on the cloud, one like the Son of Man. We have to go back to the Old Testament, the book of Daniel, for the background of this. Daniel, after those large prophetic books, you have the Psalm, then you have Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel. Move just past the middle of your Bible and you come to the book of Daniel. We're going to chapter 7. We've been to chapter 7 quite a bit because it's a great prophetic chapter. And it talks about that key individual, the Antichrist. And we talked about in chapter 13 of the book of Revelation. Then you come to verse 9. I kept looking until thrones were set up and the Ancient of Days took his seat. The Ancient of Days is God the Father. Picturing his eternality. His vesture was like white snow. The hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was ablaze with flames. Awesome scene. You come to verse 13. I kept looking. And, um, further description down through verse 10. But down to verse 13. I kept looking in the night visions. Behold, with the clouds of heaven. No, here we have the clouds. And one like a son of man was coming. So there's where we get this background for what we have in Revelation chapter 14, verse 14. I saw a cloud, and one sitting on the cloud like the son of man. Jesus' favorite title for himself during his earthly ministry was son of man. He is both son of God and son of man. Son of God emphasizes his deity. Son of man emphasizes his humanity. And during his earthly life, he did emphasize his humanity. He'd been born into the human race, became fully, completely a man without ceasing in any way to be fully and completely God. 
He is the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven. He came up to the Ancient of Days and was presented before Him. To Him was given dominion, glory, and a kingdom that all the peoples, nations, men of every language might serve Him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which will not pass away. His kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. I want you to know, the book of Revelation does not change anything about this Old Testament prophecy. Some of their confusion think, well, in the coming of the New Testament, now the kingdom has come, it's in our hearts, so we can go back and redo the Old Testament. I don't think this kingdom is in existence yet. I don't think all the peoples and nations, the men of every language are serving Him. I don't see the evidence of His dominion over all things. That's why when we get to the book of Revelation, it's yet future. Christ's crucifixion had happened 60 years earlier. John gives no indication that they're in the kingdom. If Christ is ruling over all peoples and all nations, John's a prisoner on the island of Patmos. <coughs> the kingdom is yet future. Uh, and it's prophesied here in Daniel. Hundreds of years before John will write, as God prepares for further revelation. So that's the background. Come to the book of Matthew, chapter 24. A passage I just referred to uh, a little bit ago. The Sermon on the Mount, where Christ talks about future events. Again, we've been in this chapter several times because of its connection to the book of Revelation. Because the book of Revelation is taking what has been revealed by earlier prophets, by Christ, and now clarifying, not changing, but clarifying by giving additional revelation and also helping put it in order so we can understand it more clearly. Christ has talked about the seven year tribulation down through verse 14 and verse 14 the verse I referred to. The gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world and then the end will come. We saw that in verse 8 of chapter 14 of Revelation. Then verse 15, the abomination of desolation spoken of through Daniel the prophet. We saw that when we went back to Daniel. We considered this. Then here Christ speaks about it. We saw this in chapter 13 of Revelation and then in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 we went and saw the fulfillment of the abomination of desolation as it will happen in the future. Then we're going to verse 21 in the middle that breaks out that great tribulation such as never, not occurred since the beginning of the world until now, nor ever will be. That seven year period will be the worst. We've already seen billions of people die in the first half of the tribulation. And we have the worst yet to come. Uh, that's why Jesus said, in verse 22, unless those days had been short, cut short, no flesh, no life would have been saved. No one would survive. Then at the end of this time, verse 29, immediately after the tribulation of those days, you have these events. We've seen some of these uh, in anticipation in Revelation. Verse 30, then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky. And all the tribes of the earth will mourn. And they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. And I tell you, that has not happened. There ought not to be a living believer who is an amillennialist. No one. I mean, how clear do you have to be? Go out and look. Have you ever seen Christ coming on the clouds? If you have, you've been on something. It hasn't happened. But when it happens, the whole world will see it. And the people of the earth will mourn. You know why? 
He's coming on ju in judgment on the unbelieving world, as well as deliverance for his people. And that's what we're talking about in Revelation. And the angels are involved. He'll send forth his angels. And you see these angels involved in chapter 14. There's half a dozen of them that come forward. As involved with this return of Christ and this final work in preparation for the kingdom. Come back, uh, come and stop in Acts chapter 1. This is the ascension of Christ. The ascension of Christ, 40 days after his crucifixion and resurrection, the ascension marks his leaving earth. Return and going now to heaven to be seated at the right hand of the Father. Not to come back and be on earth again until his second coming. He will appear to John, but he's not here walking the earth. During the 40 days after his resurrection, he had interaction with his disciples. Remember, he appeared to them in the upper room and so on. Giving further explanation and revelation. So they would be prepared to represent him uh, after his ascension. So that's what's going on. He's appearing to them again in Acts chapter 1. Chapter 1 picks up where the Gospel of Luke leaves off. Luke being the author of both the Gospel of Luke and the book of Acts, the human writer. Uh, he tells them they're going to be baptized with the Spirit shortly in verse 5. They have a question in verse 6. Lord, is it at this time you are restoring the kingdom to Israel? They're looking for the kingdom. Now he doesn't say to them, guys, it's time for you to wake up. The kingdom already exists. It's in your heart. No, he doesn't. They're looking for the earthly kingdom that existed under... David and Solomon as a united kingdom under Saul uh, initially uh, then ceased to exist as an independent kingdom in steps, first with the Assyrian conquering of the northern ten tribes and then Judah and Benjamin in the Babylonian captivity. And even though they've been restored to the land they are a subject nation. The times of the Gentiles ruling over Jerusalem and the Jews began, as we noted, with the Babylonian captivity. Never again will Israel truly function as an independent nation and kingdom. It's dominated by the Gentile powers are you going to extend the king, establish the kingdom? No. You don't need to know. He doesn't say, I'm not, and doesn't say, I will. It would have been discouraged. Think about it if he had said to them, man, the kingdom was coming for at least a couple thousand more years. They don't need to know that. All they have to do is have the information and they will have to live faithfully. Like us. All we have to do is be faithful today. Is the rapture going to occur tomorrow or next week? I want to know, because why? If he's coming tomorrow, what are you going to change in your life? Changing. We're to be living in expectation. They were to be living with the information they had. Uh, you don't know, need to know when, what's going to happen. The Father has fixed this by his own authority. You see that authority demonstrated in chapter 14 in a moment. You'll soon receive power when the Holy Spirit comes and you're going to carry this message to all the nations. That's a new dimension. We looked at this before Christ had told his disciples, don't go to anyone outside the lost of the children of Israel. But now the gospel is going to be carried everywhere. Then while they were looking, verse 9, he was lifted up while they were looking on, a cloud received them out of their sight. Then two angels appeared. And they said, Men of Galilee, verse 11, Why do you stand looking into the sky? This Jesus who has been taken up from you into heaven 
will come in just the same way as you have watched him go into heaven. That's when he'll return to establish the kingdom. That's why he said in Matthew 24, if people tell you Christ has come, don't believe it. When he comes, everybody on earth will know. And just as the disciples could behold as he ascended in the cloud, so he'll return with the clouds. That's where we are in Revelation, previewing and looking forward to that time. Matthew. Revelation 19 is when it will actually be unfolded in detail. Remember, we're just getting a preview of what's ahead. So back in Revelation 14, verse 14. Then behold, I looked and behold a white cloud, sitting on the cloud with one like a son of man, having a golden crown on his hand, on his head, a sickle in his hand. The golden crown. You're familiar, there are two crowns in Greek. A diadem crown, let me just carry that over, transliterating over in English and Greek. A diadem, that's the crown of a ruler, a sovereign, a king. Uh, and the Stephanos crown, that's the crown of a victor, one who has won uh, the victory. That's the kind of crown that would be given uh, the Games, the Olympic Games, the Corinthian Games, uh, to a winner. He'll get a Stephanos. Here Christ has a golden Stephanos on his head. Now he will be one who wears both the diadem and the Stephanos, but here the emphasis is on he is the victor. And he comes now to crush an unbelieving world with great destruction like has never occurred. Armageddon. He will stand victorious on Mount Zion. So he has the crown of the victor. And he had a sharp sickle in his hand. And that picture of the sharp sickle is it's ready for judgment. We picked up some of these biblical images the number 666 of Revelation 13. And most people that don't know very much about the Bible know the number 666, and they'll use it in different ways just because it's something awesome and uh, terrible. Armageddon. You hear Armageddon. Oh boy, it's Armageddon's coming. They're not talking about biblical Armageddon. They've got something else. They pick up and they know. This is what we're talking about here. This sharp sickle in the hand, we have that now, you see what? The Grim Reaper. What are we praying the Grim Reaper? He's got that hood on and that black garment and he's carrying a sickle in his hand. He's bringing death. Well, here we are, where it comes from. Uh, this is the time of judgment. The one who is the victor is coming to claim his victory destroy every last one of his enemies. When you get done with Armageddon and the judgments associated with it, there will not be left alive one unbelieving person on the face of the earth. That's how complete and how devastating the judgment will be. At Armageddon and then there will be judgments associated with it that we'll look into when we get to chapter 19 and the actual coming. So at the time of judgment by the one who is the ultimate victor, another angel came out of the temple. Remember we had this series of angels going back up to verse 6. I saw another angel. Verse 8, and another angel. Verse 9, then another angel. Now verse 15, then another angel came out of the temple. The temple is in heaven. It's the very presence of God. Remember, this vision is transported John to heaven. And we have the earthly tabernacle and then the temple built by Solomon uh, that reflected on earth was like in heaven. In heaven, God is, is the place where God manifests His presence before His creation most fully. God is on my present. He is here today. He is what we call omnipresent. He is everywhere. 
cannot hide from God. You get to the depths of the sea, He's there. You go to the heights of heaven, He's there. You can, But He manifests His presence, even visibly, as we saw in Daniel chapter 7. He was described, the Ancient of Days, on the throne. Well, coming out of the temple, which is the very presence, comes this angel. And he's crying out with a loud voice to him who sat on the uh, cloud, which was Christ, the Son of Man. Put in your sickle and reap, for the hour to reap has come, because the harvest of the earth is ripe. Now it's not that an angel's coming giving uh, commands to Christ, but he's coming out and announcing. And remember, in Acts 1, we didn't read it all, but uh, as the disciples have had questions about uh, the timing of things, and this goes back even to Christ's earthly ministry, he said, the Father has kept those things for himself. Now the Father is announcing through this angel, it's time for judgment to come on the earth. Uh, put in your sickle and reap. For the hour to reap has come. Because the harvest of the earth is done. Very important. We refer to this sometimes. Come back to Genesis 15. Genesis 15. And here, God is confirming his covenant with Abraham. And the animals are divided by Abraham, and then Abraham goes to sleep, and God passes in a visible way between the divided animals, birds, indicating God is taking full responsibility for the fulfillment of all the provisions of this covenant upon himself. Usually both parties to a covenant pass through those divided animals. And there would be devastating consequences if someone violated the term. Abraham sleeping. God passes through, indicating he takes full responsibility for the fulfilling of all the provisions of the covenant he made with Abraham. How can anybody say there's going to be changes? The Abrahamic covenant, that's an attack on the very character of God. But we're not here for that. Uh, come to verse 14. He tells Abraham that what he has promised will be a while away. Verse 13. God said to Abraham, Know for certain that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not yours. They'll be enslaved for 400 years. That's the Egyptian captivity. I will also judge the nation whom they serve. Afterwards they'll come out with many possessions. Remember how detailed that is. This is going to happen hundreds of years later. Then he even tells them the detail. And when they finally leave that captivity, they're going to have many things. They were slaves in Egypt. But remember what happened when they left Egypt? The Egyptians were happy to give them their possessions just to get rid of them. As for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace. Be buried in a good old age. In other words, Abraham, you're not going to see any of this during your earthly life. You're going to live a good long life. You're going to die. All of this is for something future. Then in the fourth generation, they will return here after their 400 year captivity. For the iniquity of the Amorite is not yet complete. We talk about ripening for judgment. That's what God's saying. Not time for you and your descendants to take possession of the land of Canaan, where the Canaanites, the Amorites being among them, lived. Their iniquity is not yet complete. Another way of saying we have in the picture right. God's timing in this way. You know what happened? When Israel comes out after their 40 years of wilderness wandering, after their 400 years of captivity, Joshua will lead the people in. What does God tell Joshua? You take the armies of Israel in there, you kill every man, woman, and child 
that lives in that land. <coughs> Why? It's judgment time. There's no mercy to be shown. Judgment comes. They have ripened to the point that I am ready to pour out the fullness of my wrath, and that will include everyone there. Now, Israel is not obedient, and there are consequences for that. But that's the picture you have here of being ripe for judgment. On your way back, stop at Joel. <laughs> you were thinking of that, right? Uh, after the book of Daniel, we were in the book of Daniel, then you have Hosea, then you have Joel. You hit those smaller prophetic books that always make you stop and think. Joel. Daniel, Hosea, Joel. Okay, we're in Joel chapter 3. Joel chapter 3 is about the day of the Lord, in large part. That is that seven year period. Uh, we don't have time to do a lot of this because you want to have lunch, but. Note this, uh, verse 10, beat your plowshares, chapter 3, verse 10, beat your plowshares into swords, your pruning hooks into spears. Remember the verse of the uh, prophets that's put on the United Nations building? Beat your swords into plowshares and your spears into pruning hooks. Well, before you do that, you do that when Christ comes back because there'll be no need for weapons of warfare any longer. But before then, you ought to be breathing your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears. Uh, could be a time of warfare, conflict. People don't want to hear this side. They pull a verse out of the Bible and quote it and think now that settles the matter. Often it just shows our lack of familiarity with the Bible. Now down here, verse 12. Let the nations be aroused. Come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat. For there I will sit to judge all the surrounding nations. We'll talk about that in connection with the return of Christ. The judgments of Matthew 25. Put in the sickle. For the harvest is ripe. Come, tread the... For the wine press is full. The vats overflow. For their wickedness is great. That's what we're talking about. Put in the sickle. The harvest is ripe. And we're going to go to the wine press as the picture in the last part of the chapter. Where, as you're familiar, some of you have been to Israel, some of you have seen the pictures. They would take a large stone and cut it out as a bowl. And they would put it on a higher spot. Then they put a spout out. Then they would make another stone bowl carved out, large. And then people would get in to put all the grapes dump them in as they cut them down in the top bowl. Then they bind up their garment, get in and trample around all on all those grapes, and the juice would be squeezed out, run down the spot, spout, and fill up the lower bowl. That's the picture. Come tread the wine, for the wine press is full. That's a picture. The people's iniquity have filled up the place you know, for their judgment. Pictures like the grapes had filled up that upper bowl, ready to be trampled. The people are ready to be judged and destroyed. The vats overflow, for their wickedness is great. That's what's pictured. So that comes out. Multitudes, multitudes in the day of decision, for the day of the Lord is near. In the valley of decision. Come back to Revelation chapter 14. Verse 16, we won't go back there, we're going to read some of what we just read in Joel at the end of chapter 14, but uh, you have the picture. Verse 16, then he who sat on the cloud swung his sickle over the earth, the earth was reaped. Remember we saw in Matthew 24, the angels are associated with coming out under the authority of Christ to carry out uh, a work in the world. So here. Christ swings his sickle. It's a picture. The earth was reaped. That doesn't mean there has to be a literal sickle cutting people down. It's like we use the symbol of that sweeping sickle. It is cutting people down. It's doom. It's death. It's destruction. Then you have 
verse 17, another angel. And a similar picture, a little differently described. Another angel came out of the temple. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Which is in heaven. <coughs> I tell you, the devil doesn't want me doing this. But... <coughs> It wasn't a true angel who gave me this bottle. So, yeah. Another angel came out of the temple, which is in heaven. He had a sharp sickle. And another angel, the one who had power over fire, came out of the altar. So they have another temple joined with judgment. So the angels are part of what's going on. We'll see more of this when we get to... Revelation 19, and it's uh, another passage is associated with it. Another angel, one who had the power over fire, came out of the altar. And he called with a loud voice to him who had the sharp sickle, saying, Put in your sharp sickle. Gather the clusters from the mine of the earth, because the grapes are ripe. Again, that picture. We saw that in Isaiah. We saw it in Joel 3, Isaiah 6. Uh, maybe you good Isaiah 6 yet. We're going there, huh? Right. Uh, the angel who has power over fire. Uh, the picture here comes back to uh, chapter 6. This altar. In uh, chapter 6, verse 9, under the fifth seal, I saw under the altar. The altar here is the altar of incense. We'll look at another passage in a moment. Uh, which was before... Uh, the very presence of God in the tabernacle and the temple set up. We noted this is where the prayers of God's people come. So you have here, underneath the altar, the souls of those who have been slain. And they are crying out to God for vengeance on their death. They have been martyred for their faith in Christ. And uh, they ask the question, verse 10, O Lord, holy and true, how long will you refrain from judging and avenging our blood of those who dwell on the earth? He said, it will be a while. Wait. Now we see the preview in chapter 14. We've come to the time when the judgment is there. So the altar that the angel comes out from indicates he's coming in response to the prayers of the saints that have ascended by, up to God. Come to chapter 8. Now we're under the seventh seal. And you see the angel so involved in all this. Verse 3 of chapter 8. Another angel came and stood at the altar holding a golden censer. Much incense was given to him so that he might add it to the prayers of all the saints on the golden altar which was before the throne. The smoke of the incense, the prayers of the saints went up before God. Then the angel took the censer, filled it with the fire of the altar and threw it to the earth. Remember the angel, we're in chapter 14. The angel of fire came out from the altar. The picture is he's coming out in response to the prayers of the saints that God is now ready to answer, bringing judgment and vengeance on the earth that has so mistreated his servants in their rebellion against him. Uh, so you see the connection, the, the fire. He's the angel of fire because he's coming out of number, another symbol of judgment, fire. The destruction it brings. Come back to uh, chapter 14. Verse 18, the other angel who has power over fire came out from the altar, that altar of incense where incense was added to the prayers of the saints. Remember out of the Old Testament picture where the incense was, uh, rose up before God and was a pleasing fragrance in His sight. And those prayers were pleasing and, uh, to Him and He's pleased to honor them. Now we're coming to the honoring. So He will be in fire. Destruction goes with the a picture of harvesting the earth. It's destruction on destruction. He says, put in your sharp sickle. Gather the clusters from the vine of the earth because their grapes are wrath. So the angel swung his sickle to the earth. 
gathered clusters from the vine of the earth, threw them into the great wine press of the wrath of God. Now the picture here, just like those grape clusters, gathered and thrown in to the wine press, a place where the grapes would be trampled out and crushed. So these unbelievers are thrown into the wine press of God's wrath where they will suffer destruction. And the wine press was trodden outside the city. The city will be spared. And blood came out from the wine press up to the horses' bridles for a distance of 200 miles. Which is basically uh, going from uh, south to north, north to south, covering the whole land of Israel. Before we say more about that, come back to Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah 6. And here you see something of the judgment. Of Isaiah 63, I'm sorry. Isaiah 6 about seeing the Lord high and lifted up. If we want to be in Isaiah 6. B3. <laughs> Isaiah 63. 6 3. Alright. Who is this who comes from Edom with garments of glowing colors from Basra? We'll talk about Basra in this when we get to chapter 19, the coming of the Lord. That'd be a region from going from the southern part all the way up to the north and get you 200 miles of how Christ comes. Who is this who comes? From Eden with garments of glowing colors from Basra. This one who is majestic in his apparel, marching in the greatness of his strength. It is I who speak in righteousness, mighty to save. Why is your apparel red? Your garments are like the one who treads in the wine press. You see the picture? When they would get into that wine press, they'd take those long garments up, and you know that when they would talk about gird your loins for action what they would do when they were going to do work or trample the grapes. They'd bind those long robes up and bind them around their waist. Then they would get in and trample on those grapes and walk around trampling with them with their feet. What happened? The juice would squirt out, spread up, and stain their garments. And the blood would run down and out into the lower chamber. Verse, what he says is, Verse 3, I have trodden the wine trough alone. From the peoples there was no man with me. I also trod them in my anger. I trampled them in my wrath. Their lifeblood is sprinkled on my garments. I stained all my raiment. It's an awesome picture. It's like the grapes are trampled and destroyed. So the enemies of the Lord are crushed under His feet. And their blood splashes out. And is on his garments. For the day of vengeance was in my heart. My year of recompense and redemption is come. It is a day of vengeance. It is a day of redemption. I looked and there was no one to help. I was astonished there was no one to uphold me. So my own arm brought salvation to me. My wrath upheld me. I trod down the peoples in my anger. I made them drunk in my wrath. I poured out their lifeblood on the earth. Now when we get to, we saw that in uh, Joel chapter 3 as well. That's the picture now. Come back to Revelation chapter 14. Verses 19 and 20. It's not anything new. Just a reminder, now the day is coming. So in this preview, the ultimate realization will be chapter 19. We'll get some comments about Armageddon. Certain people are gathered there in chapter 16, where the name comes from, and then the actual carrying on of events in chapter 19. This blood flowing to the horses' bridles for a distance of 200 miles. That'd be the whole extent of north to south, basically, of uh, Israel. The question, is this actually something where the blood may flow down into the Jordan Valley and it would be as high as the horse's bridle? That's a possibility. In light of Isaiah and the description here of the wine press, 
I think it is saying from throughout the whole land of Israel, this horrible, destroying bloodshed will occur, and that blood will be splashing up, as it said in Isaiah 6, on the garments. Uh, so, the whole land of Israel. Because Christ is returning to Israel. Now the whole world comes under His judgment. And in connection with His return in chapter 19, we have to consider the judgments that take place. Because not everyone dies at Armageddon. But there is a destruction that takes place there of great magnitude. But then all the peoples who are unbelievers, all the people who are alive, period, will come before Him to be judged and they'll be separated out of who goes into the kingdom. Anyone who lived thus far, now stand before Him as an unbeliever, will be executed. Only believers will go into the kingdom. So that's where we are here. All right, let's put up the summary points if we could. Just to remind you of these things. And uh, I put the verses with this, even if I don't read them all for time. You can see the first one, most important, Jesus Christ is coming again. As we saw in Revelation chapter 1, verse 7, that's the theme of the book. He's coming again on the clouds, and every eye will see Him. That's what the book of Revelation, that starts out with that declaration, and everything going on is to lead us to that point. When He comes in power and great glory, which will be chapter 19, and establishes a kingdom in chapter 20. And then there will be further rebellion and then into eternity. But we're talking about when He comes again. That's the goal. His return to earth. So Jesus Christ is coming again. We sing the song, coming again, coming again, with power and great glory. He's coming again. Number two, the world is ripening for judgment. They can expect as we move toward, and I'm not prophesying how close we are or not. I believe the rapture of the church will occur in the seven years. But we can expect as we see what is taking place in the world, the closer we get to the return of Christ and the events of the seven years, that the world will be ripening for judgment. And we see things going on in the world today that may, could, may at least make us think these could be moving us to that end. How open in display is the defiance against God? I mean, it's remarkable how in my short lifetime as a young man, I've seen such changes. You know, now we don't even know the difference between a man and a woman. And I see in one of the major women's colleges in the news in the last couple of weeks, they are going to ban the use of the word woman in their college. Because they don't want to recognize any distinction. So even though it's a woman's college, you can't refer to another woman in the college as a woman. It's a student. And we just do away with any distinctions and uh, deny the role that is God's as the Creator. All right, the world is ripening for judgment. So we don't wring our hands like the unbelievers think, oh, Christians are just as frustrated, just as upset as we are. No, I'm not pleased to see the world becoming more open and rebelling against God, but neither am I surprised. <coughs> Number three, the prayers of believers for justice will be answered. You know? Our prayers come before God. They may not be answered immediately. But God answers prayer. Now in prayer, I don't tell God what to do. But I can ask Him to do what I think is consistent with His character, consistent with His Word, what He promises to do. That's what the martyrs did. God has promised that He would avenge His people. They just ask me now, how long can you do that? They haven't initiated an idea of judgment on the unbeliever. They're just asking God, what will you do? What you promise you'll do? Because he will always do what he says he will do. Number four, Armageddon will display God's wrath on an unbelieving world. I'm not going to hear people talk about Armageddon. That made secular movies with Armageddon in the title. 
You know, somebody said, boy, you feel like you're moving toward Armageddon. Good opportunity to talk to that person. You know, that's a good observation. You know that God says that's exactly what we're doing. We're moving toward Armageddon. Then it explained to them. There is coming judgment on the world of unbelievers. Number five. Important. God's wrath is as real as God's love. And it's not as pleasant to consider. But you really understand the depths of God's love when you see something of the depths of His anger. What you are rescued from in Christ Jesus. When the Bible talks about the propitiation that took place in the blood, the death of Christ. You know the word propitiation means to turn wrath away. God turned the wrath of God away from me by bearing it Himself. Paying in full the penalty for my sin. God's wrath is real. You cannot escape it. You can be delivered from it by being covered by the death of Christ, so to speak. Having His death credited to your account. He paid full, in full the penalty for our sin. Physical death, spiritual death, eternal death, separation from God in eternal hell. God's wrath is real. God's love is real. This is a day of opportunity and choice. By God's grace, you can choose to believe what He says about you as true, a sinner, under His condemnation, doomed to eternal destruction. And realize how magnanimous God is in His love. He says, if you'll call upon Me, I'll save you. If you'll place My Son, faith, your faith in My Son, as the one who loved you and died for you and let go of everything else, I'll save you. It's, it looks like it's no choice. Would you rather go to heaven or hell? I don't know about you, but I made my decision. I, I, there's no future in going to hell. And there's no cost in that sense to me because Jesus paid it all. So I'm taking the free gift of life and being brought into a relationship with God now that goes for eternity. Let's pray again. Thank you, Lord, for the riches of your word. Lord, every word is true. Thank you for revealing yourself and your purposes and plans. Thank you, above all, for the Savior. The salvation is found for all who place their faith in him. May we live in light of these truths. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you.